joined us uh, again for the uh, live presentation. Uh, this is week number 12, amen, the 7th of April, 2021. We're running uh, through the book of Romans. Uh, tonight's uh, lesson is entitled, Whose Slave Are You? As we consider uh, Paul's um, uh, dissertation on sin, Paul is trying to get us uh, to understand uh, exactly what God has done for us and that we might come to understand what the Lord has done through Jesus Christ. Keep in mind uh, as we go through the book uh, that we're in a courtroom and that uh, Paul is presenting the argument uh, for um, um, uh, for God uh, as the prosecutor against humanity, the, the, the defendant, and that we are um, not so much accused, we are actually guilty of sinning, with sinning before God. And uh, Paul is litigating the case um, uh, on behalf of God in righteousness and saying that uh, we deserve whatever we get. <laughs> uh, we have angered God and we, we were in the earlier chapters subject to the wrath of God. But then God uh, uh, came in to our case uh, and presented us something that has never been presented before and that was, that is his grace his grace uh, through the person of his uh, son, Jesus Christ. So, so we're saved by that grace as we apply our faith in Jesus Christ. And then he's arguing for those who are pushing back, say, well, wait a minute now, you know, I'm, I'm a seed of Abraham. I don't, I don't need a, a, another method of getting to God, et cetera, et cetera. I'm circumcised. I am this, I am that. And, and Paul had to remind us all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. And so therefore all are subject to the, to the wrath of God. And, uh, and because of Jesus Christ, that, that wrath is not given. And if you accept Jesus Christ, then you are the recipient of God's grace. And, uh, and so Paul is taking us through the fact in chapter five, as you remember, uh, uh, therefore, ha uh, therefore, having uh, having peace with God, uh, therefore being justified. I'm sorry, we have peace with God now. No more of the wrath of God, but now we have His peace. Uh, and then Paul reminds us here in chapter uh, six on last week. We began with the notion that um, you know, if God's grace is that good. And it is, because that grace is amazing. And it, it, it'll clean up the raunches of sinner. It'll clean you up, turn you around, place your feet on solid ground. Well, if that's if that grace be that good, why don't I just keep sinning so I can keep on getting some of that good grace? And Paul said, yeah, I know some of y'all out, like, out there think that way. But he says, God forbid that we would take God's, uh, um, uh, the, the opportunities that God is giving us to deliver us from the penalty and power and the presence of hell. And then we would turn it on God by continuing to do the very thing he's trying to get us to stop doing. And so last week, as you remember, we talked about all of that. Uh, and uh, um, reminded ourselves that in chapter six through eight, Paul is going to focus on this phrase uh, we call sanctification. He talks about, he's already led us into justification, and we've learned something about imputation, how sin is transferred. If sin can be transferred from Adam to us, then, then righteousness can be transferred or imputed from Jesus Christ to us, okay? Uh, if one be true, then the other side of the uh, algebraic equation must also be, be true, uh, or in this case, the theological equation. Uh, so we talked about that and we talked about uh, justification. 
and, and, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died uh, to bring us to this position of sonship. Uh, for as many as received him, unto them gave he the power to become the children of God. Now this sanctification process is a little different because uh, you could be sa saved and still be dirty uh, or, or subject to, 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 to continuous uh, dirt uh, in, an, in, in your life. So sanctification then is the process whereby we are gradually the, the, that's the internal transformation of a newly freed slave of sin into a fully matured and completely free individual. Like Israel coming out of Egyptian bondage, they, were, they, they still had the slave mentality and they were not a cohesive nation. So, so, so over 40 years of wilderness wandering uh, God uh, uh, transformed them from this uh, disjointed band of, uh, of tribes to the 12 tribes of Israel, gave them leadership, uh, uh, understanding those that didn't want to transform. Uh, their, their caucus was buried in the desert in those 40 years. And when they came out of the desert, they were wholly sanctified, having received the law again the tablets again, having uh, received the Levitical laws, the 603 uh, Levitical laws, uh, laws, 603 Levitical laws uh, in the three categories of uh, uh, moral, civil, and ceremonial. Added to the 10, gave them 613 laws, uh, commandments, that they were responsible for, memorized, and was subject uh, to either reward or punishment based on it. But this sanctification process, let me stay focused uh, on that process of ch changing them, cleansing them, and setting them apart from all other nations uh, going forward. And so in chapter six, uh, here Paul introduces uh, this threefold method that leads to uh, sanctification that you know, reckon, and yield. You've got to know some things. You've got to reckon or consider some things, and then you have to uh, literally surrender uh, one's self going forward. So we talked about the first two on last week in last week's lesson. Uh, in the second half, we want to talk about the, the yielding aspect or the surrendering. I like the King James uh, using the word uh, uh, to yield, uh, for we oftentimes say, Lord, must, must I, I yield, I yield, what must I do to be saved? And, uh, and then that's where we are told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so in verse uh, 13, um, it is that we should to offer oneself, the word yield in the King James and the word, that same word over in the new, in the NIV is to um, render, uh, render offering, uh, I'm sorry, offer oneself to God. Same thing, the surrendering of or the, or the rendering of, uh, of, of self to God for the purpose of this cleansing or transformation. So there's a wrong kind of, of yielding uh, that we are going to talk about, uh, re reintroduce here tonight. And that's when we yield our members to sin. That's, that's not what we want to do, even though that's what we normally do. That we normally, in the course of the day, offer ourselves uh, as, um, um, as, as, as members to sin. But the right kind is the, what he's going to talk about for the rest of this chapter. Uh, the, the body is indifferent between vice and virtue. And uh, not, not, not only the body, while I'm here, let me just also say this. The soul is also neutral. The soul 
uh, uh, is a blank canvas. Uh, so you, you're born with a soul and you're born with a body, uh, but you don't. But but one is one is one does not have a, a spirit. One has to have their spirit reborn. So and and ah, uh, I don't want to do that now. I don't, I don't have the I need diagrams in front of me because it does it can get complicated. But let me just say it this way, just as the body can go either way, you can enjoy virtue and uh, on Sunday morning and be as holy, <laughs> sing as melodious as one can uh, in the choir. And then on Saturday night, you can have, uh, you could be the chiefess of sinner, amen, using the same body, amen. Uh, and, and, and as we get into this, uh, there's, a, there's a place, uh, certainly chapter 12, when we present our bodies a living sacrifice, uh, we'll, we'll take a moment to talk about the body, soul, and spirit. In fact, that's, that's actually chapter 7. Uh, I can actually do that in now. Uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I can do that in chapter 7. But the soul is neutral, and it has to, and, 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 and so where the, 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 the destiny of the soul is determined by what, is, what it does while it's on earth, doing its earth years. Um, uh, um, uh, if, it's if, if the spirit is never reborn, if you're never born again, if you never claimed uh, to be a child of God, then you, and when your body is decayed in the ground, your soul is standing there uh, defenseless and it's going to hell. Your soul is going to hell. That is the eternal part of who we are. By the same token, if the spirit is brought back to life and it is engaged uh, by bringing the body into alignment and surrendering, having the body yield itself to the things of God, the righteousness of God, the soul also will join in in that threefold uh, uh, chorus of, of hallelujah, and that you will be totally whole again, made whole again, body, soul, and spirit. Uh, uh, when the body does die and decay, the soul and the spirit is absent from that body. You're going to be in the presence of the Lord. Your soul is, is going to be saved or will be saved. Okay, but I just want to kind of throw that out when I when I came across Swindoll's uh, statement on the body is indifferent between vice and virtue. For Christ cannot be cannot be uh, cannot for Christ came not to destroy your nature, but to uh, transform your ability to freely yield your member uh, your members to God. Remember, we were hopeless and, and, and helpless uh, and could not break free from the cycle of sin because the grip of Satan was so strong in the world. But Jesus has come to break that, 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 that cycle, his, uh, to destroy the works of the devil, uh, uh, who has come to kill, steal, and to destroy. And by breaking, by, by, by Christ breaking um, uh, that cycle, we are free also to break the cycle in our own lives. If we choose to, if we yield our members to God for righteousness. And so uh, we, we're free to be a slave, but who, 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 who are you going to be a slave to? Who are you going to serve? And this is the second part of, of, of Paul's argument here in Romans chapter six. So just as he began uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, he begins chapter 6, verse 15 with a, with a rhetorical question. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? He says, God forbid. In other words, Paul concludes his uh, response to the question in, 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 that, first, uh, in that first verse, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Uh, with the statement, um, the, the answer to which that, uh, that, that, that question is asked in verse 1, he answers in verse 14. He says, sin shall not be masters over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, And so Paul answers that first half of that question, uh, starting in verse 1 and then finally ending in, uh, chapter 6, verse 14. In other words, concerning that verse, 
He says, because believers can now choose not to sin. They have the freedom to rise above the law. This prompts a second rhetorical question. Again, one Paul heard often in response to the gospel as he was on these journeys, missionary journeys. He's asking a second question in verse 15. He says, shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? The first one is, shall we sin because we're under grace? This one is, shall we sin because we're under the law? And since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Okay. Notice the, the, the parallel, and I should, guess I should have put both of these uh, questions side by side so you can see the parallelism in it. Paul is, is, um, is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, Hebrew, Hebrew scripture is, 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 is noted for its parallelism, uh, setting one thing against another and, 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 and presenting its opposites in most instances. So if you're under grace, why don't we stay in, under grace and sin? He said, well, no. He said, well, if we're under the law and not no longer uh, uh, under the law, why don't we keep on sinning, sinning because we're not under the law? <laughs> and so Paul has to now address that concern that he's anticipating from his from his readers uh, back in Rome. So Paul responds with the same uh, uh, the same response as he responded before and that is God forbid or one translation by no means or may such a thing never occur. Again Paul is uh, uh, proceeds to explain why this idea cannot be accepted. That is, believers are now free to choose not to sin. They have the freedom to rise above the law, okay? Um, uh, and, and so he goes on, he says, then know ye not that to whom you yield yourself to serve, to obey, or servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin, unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So we have a choice to make who we gonna serve, okay? Like go, but Ghostbusters, who you gonna call? Amen, who you gonna serve? Because you have free choice and, and, and because we have this freedom to choose, uh, we can either choose to sin or we can choose to obey unto righteousness. And so here again, Paul asks, this rhetorical question out of verse 15, uh, do you know, I'm sorry, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slave for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin that results in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness, there in verse verse 16. Paul is again, who, who are you going to serve? Because there is no middle ground. There is, there is no neutral ground. You know, you, 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 first of all, you're going to hell by default. Okay. So, so, so you can't say, well, I haven't done certain things. Therefore, um, I, I, I ought to go to heaven. I've not sinned. You can, you can live a morally, uh, sinless life, uh, you know, you, sin is not what, sin is not, <laughs> sin is not the reason why you're going to hell. Folks go to hell because they've not accepted Jesus Christ, who is the, um, uh, the savior or the redeemer, uh, from God's wrath. God is angry with sinners, uh, who continue to sin they are in danger of his wrath. And he's going to say that here in, in, in verse 20, 23. Okay, anticipate me, go on down and read it. Okay, because, because, because the, the payment for sin is death. It's always been that way. It was, it was the, that's written in, in, in granite in glory. Uh, all the way back to Adam. Adam had to die because he sinned. In fact, that's part of the first commandment. Um, uh, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
It's right there. It's in the commandment. And so God can't, God cannot change it now. I mean, once it's, you know, like the Medes and the Persians, once the command has gone forth, you can't call it back. You just got to do something to change, uh, do something to, to supersede it, okay? And Jesus Christ is God's way of superseding that, that law. That is, he's going to die in your place. Something got to die. Either you die or Jesus die. Okay. And so, and so if you never accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to hell because you have not accepted Jesus Christ. Sin is the natural thing that, that natural people do. You know, God knows you're a sinner. You know, that's nothing new. You're going to hell because you're sinning. Yeah. God is willing to overlook sin if you accept his son, Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, if your faith is in Jesus Christ, for whom the grace of God has been sent to you through Christ, through, great, uh, through, through Christ, then all you have to do is supply your faith in Christ, that grace delivers you from the penalty because Jesus paid the penalty with his own life. So again, there's no middle ground. So these folks talking about, well, I don't, I don't, I don't accept Jesus Christ, but I'm, I don't, I'm not mad with God either. God said, hey, you know, it ain't about what you want to do. This is the rules of this particular salvation game. Either play by my rules, or don't be surprised at the end of your life you're sitting there talking about, I'm going to heaven. God is gonna say, well, <laughs> you made up your own rules, and my rules were are, are, are explicit. Okay, they're unchangeable. Not one jot or tittle from the law shall be shall shall fall from the law until all of it's been fulfilled. Okay, no middle ground on this. So as the Lord Jesus Christ said, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God uh, and and Mammon, as we understand what we're going to do with our lives, with or without Christ. If you if if you have Christ in your life, you ought to be living righteously and holy because the sanctification process has begun in you through the power of the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost still ain't gonna make you act right if you don't wanna act right. Oh, I wish I was in class with y'all so y'all could raise your, I could see your faces, I could tell what's going on. Uh, Paul is asking in effect, why would you choose a master whose dedicated purpose is to keep you enslaved and ultimately kill you. I mean, Satan, when you, if you ought to look at his full uh, benefit package. I mean, uh, he, you know, his, his, his medical dental care is, 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 is suspect, his, his retirement plan, uh, uh, has no air conditioning. What well, you, you are? <laughs> Paul uses the word dolos, doulos or dolos, the most abject, uh, uh, servile term for a slave in the Greek language. This is the same word uh, uh, we get from over in the Book of Acts um, uh, for deacons. This is the same word in Philippians two. Uh, that Jesus made himself of no reputation, but took on the form of a doulos. Okay, this is the lowest of slaves. This ain't this ain't indentured servants. This is a stone slave with no rights and no authority. Paul points out that being a slave to sin leads to death. He's going to say that in verse twenty-one, and we know what he's going to say in verse twenty-six of this this chapter. This is not physical death only, or even spiritual death only, but death in general as the natural consequences and the inevitable results of sin. Again, going back to Genesis 2.17, that's the commandment. It is ingrained in the commandment that was first given to humans, okay? And death is about being separated. It is the separation from the things to which we are connected. And so Paul uses the word death in at least three senses in this word, this writing. The biblical, I'm sorry, the, the biological fact of physical death 
as the judgment of God upon all human life, okay? That, that God has already determined that uh, part of the uh, breaking of the uh, first commandment in the garden was gonna lead to a, a, a decaying of the physical body, okay? That the physical death will be a separation from the physical things of this world. Uh, secondly, there's the spiritual death that all men in their pre-Christian state, that we are spiritually dead before we come to Christ, before we embrace the notion uh, that Christ died for us, that, that, that calling upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. This is born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Uh, Jesus to Nicodemus, you must be born again of the water and of the spirit, okay? And then thirdly, there is the notion of eternal death uh, as the final judgment of God on the life of sin. Um, 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 uh, this is again, this is the lake of fire. This is the final uh, aspect of one's uh, separation, okay? Uh, that 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 if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, then that individual will automatically appear before the judgment of, before the uh, great white throne judgment in in Revelation. Uh, I want to say Revelation uh, twenty, uh, and uh, and all whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That is the that is eternally separated from God tormented day and night because because we think the word death means the end of existence it only means separation from your current separation from from the realm in which you are uh, you are residing so so physical death you're separated from the physical things of this world Spiritual death, you are separate from the things of the spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, uh, um, in, in all aspects of, uh, of heavenly or positively, uh, positive glory, uh, things in glory, et cetera, et cetera, spiritually. Uh, no angels, no, no interaction with the spirit world, okay? Uh, and, and then third and finally, the eternal death Again, the final separation from God. And, and you haven't existed. Why? Because the soul is eternal. Because remember, when God breathed into the nostrils of Adam, um, a man became a living soul. And uh, anything from God is eternal. Anything presented from God to man, even the plan of salvation, it's eternal. And so man's soul is eternal. So it, it's, it's like God. It has what we call eternality the eternity of, the eternality, an adjective for, for the noun eternal. The eternality of, of the soul is that it's going to be in the lake of fire in torment. Why? Because one did not accept his son, who is the only provision for deliverance from the penalty of sin. So being a doulos tool, uh, or slave to obedience, that is to God and his gospel, obviously, leads to righteousness, righteousness in the sense um, to eternal life or, or glorification, that, that, that we receive the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the, uh, uh, the approval of God, so that we can, at the time of transition, because uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life. So at the time of transition or, or, or the change, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when we see him, we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. Mortal will put on immortality, corruption, immor incorruption, and we shall be like him, him being Christ. And uh, we're going to be like him and we're going to be with him because he has gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, there we shall be also. 
Philip say, Lord, show us the way. He says, I am the way, <laughs> the truth and the life. Get right, church, and let's go home. So one can choose sin, which leads to death, or one can choose to obey God and receive his approval and his righteousness. Again, death is the normal consequence of sin. That is your disobedience of God or disobeying God, while righteousness is the normal consequence, if I can use that word again, of obeying God and living for him. Because if you live for him, you're going to reign with him. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> and so Paul goes on with his discussion here, in verses 17. He says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teachings to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Notice that you're not gonna be able to get away from what Paul is describing your complete obedience to, either the slave to sin or the slave to righteousness. He wants that to sink into your mind and your understanding uh, to his readers. There, there, there is only one or the other. There's no middle ground. Either you're gonna be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. Now we'll talk about carnality when we get to chapter seven, okay? But right now he's talking about the spiritual man and the natural man, the one who has, who has given one's life to Christ. And you have to do it from the heart. He says in this discussion, Paul reminds, uh, this, this discussion reminds Paul of what the grace of God has already accomplished in the reader's lives. And Paul bursts forth in praise by when he says, but thanks be to God. Um, a, a, a short uh, outburst of uh, praise and glory. Uh, thanks be to God for what we have done, for what God has done for us, I should say it that way. Um, but, uh, but as he goes forward, he's saying through grace, something happened immediately when a person receives the grace of God through faith. She or he is instantly given a new heart. The Holy Ghost comes in. That part of regeneration is that you have a new uh, heart. Uh, you have you you're given a new spirit, okay, uh, a, a new nature, if, if you will, that hates sins and desires to obey its new master a, a, through righteousness. And we're going to talk about this next week. Um, uh, uh, the, what the problems are. Uh, when you have a new nature, remember anything new is brand new has to have its own beginning. Okay. And it's, it's like a babe in, in, in Christ. We're going to talk about the, 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 the stages of development, uh, growing up just as a, a natural baby, a person grows from baby to toddler to, 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 to adolescence, and then become a full grown adult. So it is in, in the spirit world, you, you're born again, and that new nature is like a baby and uh, subject to, uh, to, 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 to dwarfism. Uh, if it's not properly cared for, uh, it can be, it become malnourished. It can become uh, disabled. Um, it depends on how you take care of that new nature. Uh, whether that nature grows uh, strong in faith or it becomes weak and uh, in, uh, as an invalid uh, because you are not properly uh, uh, taking care of the spirit on the inside. And again, God ain't going to make you love him. God, ain't, ain't, God will not make you do anything you don't want to do okay? because that's your free will. Okay, He didn't make Adam eat that fruit. He made Adam wish he hadn't, okay, um, going forward. So, so it has to come from the heart. That's what love is. Remember, if death means separation, love means choice. If death means being separated from something, the word love means making a choice, okay? And the choice has to be on the part of the person. 
you have to choose Jesus. You have to fall in love with Jesus. You have to, you, 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 if you love him, you'll keep his commandments, okay? To obey wholeheartedly requires a willing abandonment from sin to the truth of the message. The gospel that he's he's saying here, or the doctrine is, I think King James uh, in, in verse 17, he says, uh, from the heart that form, uh, that form of doctrine, uh, or over in the NIV, it says, um, uh, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching or doctrine, okay, uh, or an oracle, the oracles, that which is from God, a, a, a teaching oracle, that has now claimed your alliance, okay? You pledge your allegiance to the flag. You, you need to pledge your allegiance to God. Uh, Christian obedience is never coerced or coercive, co coercive. It is always voluntary, okay? Um, uh, you coming to church, you reading your Bible, you praying, uh, we can set patterns up. We can tell you what the doctor teachings on that. We can give you model prayers. We can give you uh, patterns. We can give you rosary beads. You can count down. We can we can give you the five. Uh, uh, the, the the we can give you the, the uh, in prayer. We can give you the the act uh, acts uh, uh, model. The A C A C T S uh, adoration. Uh, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I mean, you, you, there's all kinds of stuff out there to help you. But if you don't want the help, if you don't receive the help, if you don't come to the Bible study, <laughs> it's voluntary. The teaching then, or the doctrine, was not entrusted to the convert, but the converts to the teaching. Now, this is critical to understand how God has uh, made uh, this plan of salvation available to us, uh, that, that he didn't entrust that to us, okay? But the convert has to be entrusted into the teaching, that we have to come to the gospel. Yes, the gospel is preached and presented, but if we're going to understand it, we got to come to the teacher. The te we, we're not going to dumb down the gospel for a person. You can't dumb it down. If you, if you, you know, sermonettes produce, produces Christianettes, okay? Half Christians, half-hearted, half-baked, uh, non-tithing, non-praying, uh, sporadic uh, Christianettes. I mean, they're not full-blown Christian. They, they just, they just have an outward appearance, appearance without an inward change, okay? You have to come to the teachings that God has put forth as a mean, means and method of transforming your life through sanctification. The gospel message with all of its ethical implications represent an existing body of truth into which new believers are brought by faith. You got to come to the gospel. The gospel or the doctrine is not brought to the sinner, but the sinner is brought to the message. You got to come up to a higher ground to receive what thus saith the Lord. Yeah, you got to go down and get the sinner. You know, just as you are, just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Yeah, we go down and get you, but we're going to bring you up to a higher place, higher ground, that you might receive the unadulterated, the uncompromising truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's worth the trip. Help me, Holy Ghost. So, so there in, in verse 16, it says, are you a slave to sin or to obedience? Okay, the question is asked in 16, Notice, if you will, how Paul puts that together for us in verse 17, okay? He says, but thanks be to God that, that though you used to be a slave to sin, he's given us the credit that we're no longer. You used to serve sin. He said, you have wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, okay? Then he goes on to say in verse 18, how can we become slaves to obedience. 
how can we appropriate what it is that God is giving us? You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Aren't you glad about that? I know I am. Okay. And so here in verse 18, Paul states that those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ have been given a new lease on life. You have been set free for the for whom the Lord has set free. They're free indeed. We're free from sin, but we still have our allegiance or slavery to righteousness. And that's a good thing. Okay, that's a good thing. And then Swindoll went into some illustration. He talked about emancipation proclamation. He talked about even after the Civil War, uh, folks had to go to go to sharecropping, which was tantamount to uh, being back into slavery, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things, he, make, he makes a good point here. Uh, that even though we have been set free, we can engage ourselves, if we're not careful, in the sharecropping uh, on Satan's uh, 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 farm, become indebted again to him. So here Paul says, he wants to use an example from everyday life, or as he says here in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men, because the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to inquire unto inquire, inquiry, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness, okay? In other words, he said, just as you have used to offer yourself as slaves to impurities and to an ever increasing wickedness, what I say, inquiry, <laughs> iniquities, I'm sorry, into iniquities, unto iniquity. It, it just kept getting worse, worse, one um, getting worse uh, in, in their uh, degradation um, uh, and ever increasing wickedness. So now offer yourself as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. In other words, just as your iniquities kept you on the treadmill of performing other iniquities, so let your yielding of yourself or the surrendering of yourself to become a servant to, to, to righteousness lead you on that treadmill, which will, which will bring you to um, uh, holiness, uh, a, 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 a a characteristic of God, a trait of God going forward. Okay. So if one can lead you to unclean cleanliness and the furtherance of iniquities upon iniquities in a negative sense, so then by you yielding to a positive, that is unto righteousness, it can lead you to further righteousness to righteousness to holiness and certainly to uh, the, the 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 full the, the the full implications of sanctification so while the illustration of slavery is powerful it is flawed in one important respect the truth paul labors to teach is really a paradox here slavery to god is a greater freedom a human can ever know and he wants to continue to use this word doulos is what, what Swindoll is, is reminding us and Paul is saying here. You would think he would use a different phrase, a slave, uh, moving from slave to sin to uh, the servant of, uh, of righteousness or to a um, caretaker of righteousness. Uh, I, think, I think in my, uh, what Paul has in mind for us is that uh, you know, the same energy, the same mental concepts uh, that we have engaged 
uh, to, 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 to freely and subconsciously engage in our sinfulness, he says, I want that same kind of wholeheartedness, free movement, free will expression to move you into being a slave for righteousness, okay? As you approach the gospel, as you as you go to the gospel, instead of the gospel coming down to your level, you move up to the level to where you can appropriate it, learning and studying to show yourself approved that you are a workman unto God, that you need not be ashamed. When God created Adam and Eve, they perfectly bore the creator's image. They lived in a perfect harmony with their created purpose, which was to live in limitless communion with God, to enjoy uninhabited or uninhibited rather, intimacy with one another, and to rule over the rest of creation as vice, as God's vice regents. That God created this, this, this perfect environment called the Garden of Eden uh, to be a place where they would be in perfect harmony with him. Okay. Never was humankind so free as when they lived in harmony with their created purpose, or as Paul chooses to put it, as slaves to righteousness. And he wants us to keep that mental image. When we serve righteousness, we not only please God, we do what is best for ourselves. That's how the Lord created the universe to work before it was corrupted through disobedience. But humanity exchanged the, the truth for a lie and looked to sin rather than their creator to meet their basic needs, okay? And while I'm here, let me make sure that uh, going forward, we're going to uh, have a good working definition for, for the word sin. Uh, uh, sin is, um, um, let me get it together. Um, <laughs> help me, Holy Ghost. It's been a long day. The legitimate meeting a legitimate need, okay? Because there is where's that phrase at? Uh, basic needs. God has given us; He has given humanity uh, some basic needs, even greater than in some of the other things that He has animals, uh, lower forms that He has created. Basic needs. Sin can be defined as taking a God-given legitimate need and attempting to fulfill it in an illegitimate way, okay? A legitimate basic need being fulfilled with or by an illegitimate mean or method. And anytime you take what God has given you as legitimate and basic, uh, need for, for, for humanity, and you start fulfilling it illegitimately or, or outside the realm or the commandments of God, then you're, you're, that's, that's sin. That's it. That's a good working definition of sin. So that decision only perpetrated sin and intensified the accompanying bondage. This is the downward cycle of sin. This is what he's saying in verse 19 where we go from uh, to, to, from unclean cleanliness to iniquity unto iniquity. It is a downward spiraling cycle of sin. The grace of God changed all of that. Remember, by grace are you saved through faith. That's why it's amazing. Christ's sacrificial death creates the potential for us to recapture some of the innocence and freedom of Eden, okay? Get back on God's good side, <laughs> if you will, okay? And just as service to sin binds us closer to sin, service to righteousness frees us, frees us to live in harmony with our created purpose, which is to live in 
limitless communion with God, to enjoy uninhibited intimacy with one another, and to rule over the rest of creation as his vice regent. That sounds like something I read just earlier, right? <laughs> this is the restoration. This is what reconciliation does. It brings us back to the, the pre-fall of humanity, to where we were before Adam and Eve sinned. We go back to chapters uh, two, or certainly anything, anything before chapter three, that relationship uh, in Genesis chapter two is what Christ has come to restore uh, for us. This is what Paul calls sanctification or holiness. Uh, all of these words sometimes are interchanged based on uh, um, uh, where, you, where you're reading them at in the book, in the Bible. Uh, consecration, impurity, the word purity, uh, all of that means that there is a connection to Christ or certainly to God. For Paul then, sanctification is both a state of being and a process. Okay, certainly our salvation is a state of being. Either you're you either you're in the state of salvation or yea, okay, or what we call our our uh, position. Okay, you are positioned for south. You in the position that you are in fact saved. Your condition is 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 um, it, it can change. Okay, through behavior. Okay. Um, even though you might say, I don't feel saved, okay, uh, that you, you, either, you either are or you are not <laughs> saved, okay? You can, you, when you say you don't feel, it means that you, you're, you are behaving uh, less than a child of God. And that Holy Ghost that was in you is now convicting you so you, quote unquote, don't feel as close to God as you once felt. Okay, but that has nothing to do with your position as being saved as a child of God. So don't get those confused. Same thing with here when he says it's a state of being in a process, you are sanctified because the Holy Ghost comes to live in you. The Holy Ghost is in you. Okay, anyone in Christ, they are a new creature. Okay, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. So, so, so the process is there. Romans chapter 12, one says that that process is there, okay, uh, um, uh, where we are being transformed uh, by the renewing of our minds, okay, that's the process. The state of being is that the Holy Ghost is in you. Uh, he takes up permanent residence. There's four things he does on, on the day of your salvation, okay? You're indwelled, oh Jesus, you're indwelled with the Holy Ghost, uh, he comes in as, as a permanent comforter, uh, an advocate in your life. Uh, you have the adoption into the family of God and uh, Ephesians, uh, where it says that you are sealed until the day of redemption. Those four things immediately. And then there's like five, five or six other things that happens over time, okay? And so you are not only a, a, a state of being at the time of salvation. It is the process now of cleansing you and and and, and washing you uh, from those things that have so polluted you uh, from birth to the time you uh, make a confession of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So while this Greek word appears only twice in this letter, this word sanctification that we use for sanctification, it is nevertheless the central theme for all of chapter six, seven, and eight. How do we get, we're trying to answer the question now, how do we become servants of righteousness? Okay. And Paul's going to take us through, uh, he's going he's, he's gonna to take us, uh, chapter seven is a, um, I don't want to use the word detour. Chapter seven is, is, is he going to get raw? <laughs> chapter seven is, um, uh, is the is the struggle is the struggle because because you your 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 nature is the, the nature that has that you have nurtured uh ever since you was born in your selfishness your your terrible twos 
your 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 uh, uh, traumatic threes and your uh, falling on the floor fours. You know all that all that stuff which was self-centered and egotistical. All of that is who you is, who who you have become until the time you accept Jesus Christ. And even on the moment you says yes to Jesus. Uh, you know, there there was this spiritual atmosphere in which that might have happened. It don't always have to be in church or at a revival, but but you came to a knowledge and said, I yield, I yield, what must I do to be saved? Okay. As soon as you left the, the meeting hall, as soon as you confessed Christ, as soon as you came down to the altar, uh, that's and, and left, uh, that's when you got home. That's when the devil started turning the heat up. Oh, you didn't really, you ain't going back there. I know you ain't going, you, all that stuff you said, you didn't really mean that, did you? And again, that nature, that side of you is going to now struggle against or war against this new uh, babe in Christ in you, uh, this new uh, found uh, a purpose in you. And uh, you got to hurry up and let it grow up quicker and faster so that it can contend with and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, push back against the things of your own nature, okay? And we'll talk about that because that's that's where the struggle is. How? Because we're answering the question, how do I become a slave uh, to righteousness? I already know how to become a slave to sin. I, you, you know, you've been doing that. We've been doing that since birth, okay? It's me, me, mine. Uh, uh, mine, mine, give me, give me, I want it, amen. Uh, the id, the, the, the ego, um, all of that uh, in psychology comes, comes to play in that, even though Paul is not talking psych psychology here, uh, those of you and us that know about it say, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, well, you know, the Bible does have uh, all of that, all of that, um, um, uh, 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 discipline uh, contained in it. Okay, from history to 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 social uh, social science, uh, uh, psychology, um, um, mathematics. I mean, it's all in there. Okay, God knew what He was doing when He put this book together. So Paul goes on to say for us as we come to the close to this this uh, chapter. He says, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from or in regards to being free from, okay? Uh, righteousness, righteousness didn't, didn't matter to you in so many words. He says, but what advantage, what fruit have you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of these things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit or your advantage unto holiness, or in other words, sanctification, and the end is everlasting life, okay? So when we were in sin, we didn't worry about righteousness, okay? Um, um, that we were free from or didn't have any regards for this righteousness. Uh, so what advantage is there uh, for you living in sin? Paul, again, clarifies the believer's choice. Sin and righteousness are mutually exclusive. Again, Jesus states, you cannot serve two masters, okay? God created humanity with certain needs, in the beginning, those physical, emotional, and spiritual needs were filled as humankind enjoyed peace with God. But after the fall of Adam in the garden, we look to sin instead. And again, this is the definition. This is one of the working definitions. Fulfilling a God need God-given need, be it physical, emotional, spiritual, filling that need illegitimately, okay? Using something that God did not prescribe as its proper fulfillment, okay? And we can, we can, we can be here all night talking about that, okay? And so what Adam and Eve attempted to do is to gain some knowledge 
that God pretty much told them um, that they didn't need. I mean, they, they, they had everything they needed in God. But then the serpent convinced, well, deceived Eve, Adam disobeyed. There, there, there are two forms of, of uh, sin going on in the garden. Um, we oftentimes just call it one sin, but God defines it as one being deceived, Eve being deceived, Adam disobeying. But, but they used the fruit to obtain something that God said, well, first of all, I don't want you to have it. It's prohibited from you, but I'm putting this tree in the middle of the garden so you see it every day. It wasn't in the corner. It says in the midst of the garden because, because, because love is a choice. If you love me, you're, gonna, you, you, you're not going to break my commandment. You're going to love me. You're going to make the right choice, and that is not eat from that tree because you already know what the consequences are. It's included in my conversation with you, Adam. Okay. So they looked to fulfill this um, uh, deficit of knowledge, if you want to want me to call it the knowledge of good and evil, uh, by partaking of the fruit, which was an illegal way. Because all they do is ask God, God, uh, I got a question. Uh, uh, what about so and so, so and so? God, I'm pretty sure God would have said, gave them the information. They need just like when a child asks you, where does babies come from? You kind of give them as much information they know based on their, their age and where they are. Amen, amen. Okay. So Paul asks another rhetorical question here in verse 21. Notice he says, he said, what is the advantage? What fruit? Okay. What is the, what are your, what is your life bearing? Uh, or producing, okay, um, uh, had you uh, then in those things whereof you are now ashamed, that the sin that you have perpetrated through life and have caused you to fail, fall, and fumble, what what is the advantage of, of that? Paul is asking uh, this question to prompt the reader to look within. You, you, got, you got to search your own mind, your own heart, your own spirit to come up with a response here. And it's a rhetorical question. So Paul is not going to wait on an answer. But again, it is a tactic by which he now causes them to pause their reading, okay, and at least contemplate it, okay? Because he says, whatever that advantage is in verse 21, he said, for the end of those things is death. I don't care. I don't care how much money you made on Wall Street. I don't care how many uh, voter suppression rules and laws you have made. Amen. It's all is going to lead to your own destruction. What do you, What do you got to show for the stuff that you've done? What is your fruit? Because the fruit is bad. If If the act is bad, the fruit is going to be bad. If the motive is bad, the outcome is going to be bad, rotten. Okay. What fruit have you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is your death. Okay. And so Paul asks, when you were trying to meet those God-given needs by pursuing sin, what did you gain? What, what, what was your advantage? Considering the taking of a mind altering drug. Okay, this is one of Swindoll's examples. He says, he said, medical experts tell you that these drugs have a double impact in the long term. That is, they increase the user's need for the drug while decreasing his or her body response. Okay, the longer you take these drugs, the more of that drug you need to reach the same level of, uh, of, of, uh, you know, highness or, uh, uh, or numbness, if that's what you're trying to do, get, get, get numb if you're talking pain pills, okay? Uh, so there's an increase in what you need to reach that level, while at the same time your body is, is adapting to the drug, and therefore it's, it's decreasing the response to that drug, okay? 
So in other words, the drug gradually creates a greater need for more. And it takes longer and long, or larger and larger doses to achieve the same satisfying effect. And there is the cycle for addiction. Okay. The body craves more of it. You need to put more in there in order to get the same gratification from the body or from the, from the drug. So the body physiologically and psychologically uh, will respond uh, the way in which your body is saying, I need to respond to it. And so Paul says to us here in this verse, the same is true of sin. Sin is usually the result of someone trying to feel a legitimate God-given need in an illegitimate way. You, you, you're trying to fulfill your sexual needs other than getting married. Now, now you want her husband or his wife, her husband, his wife. Yeah. Illegitimate. So Paul states that once we have been freed from the bondage of sin, we still have needs that must be fulfilled. And we will look to something to fill them. We all serve something. It's just a matter of what, okay? You're going to be a servant to somebody. A servant to sin or a servant to righteousness. You, that there is no middle ground. Who are you going to serve? So while the pull of sin might be lessened, the cycle of sanctification draws the believer closer to God. Rather than leading to death, slavery to God ultimately leads to eternal life. This is what he says in verse 22. He said, but now that you've been made free and become a servant, to, a slave to God, let me keep using that doulos, uh, Greek word. He said, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end is in or results in eternal life. Aren't you glad about that? And then Paul just hits them between the eyes with this, with this Roman road verse here in Romans 6 and 23. And as if, as if you didn't already know that, he says, he's, he's kind of saying in his own mind to his readers, that, the, that the, just as the fruit of sin is death, he now gives us another economical way of, of seeing sin. He said, the, the payment for sin, the wages, you're working hard for your sin. <laughs> God says, I'm going to pay you for your sin. At some time in the future, you're going to have a payday for your sin. And that payday is going to, is going to ultimately be death. For the wages of sin is death. But Paul didn't leave us dangling. He didn't leave us hanging. He says, but the gift. If there's wages for sin, then there must be a gift from God for the righteousness. The gift is eternal life. Paul masterfully concludes his answer to the charge that grace encourages sin, all the way back to, to the verse one. What shall we say then? If we're under grace, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin? No, no, no. Then he says, well, if we're not under the law, then we can continue in sin. Then, no, 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 you can't. This verse is commonly used to explain the gospel to those who have yet to believe as part of the Roman road experience here in verse 23, okay? That we can all come to grips with this, the, these words that Paul is expressing in verse 23. But Paul writes this verse really to encourage believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's trying to encourage the saints how to become a slave to righteousness by telling them there are some, there are some road barriers, there are some obstacles uh, uh, in the way uh, that's going to prevent you from becoming a slave to righteousness, okay? And it's called sin. That, that, that sin nature is still there. But Paul writes these verses to encourage believers in sanctification, holiness, uh, 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 consecration, and purity. He says, in this concluding statement, Paul introduces a new concept 
being in Christ. Eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, or through Christ Jesus, but in Christ Jesus is 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 uh, the NIV uh, term for that, which he will take care, great care to explain in the next chapter. That 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 the only tr the only real answer to how to become a slave to righteousness is to be in Christ. Stay, get in Christ, be in Christ, stay in Christ. Be in Christ, stay in Christ will we'll, we'll bring you to that place. We have everything by virtue of being in Christ. We are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. He says that in verse 11. He says, moreover, we received eternal life by being in Christ here in verse 23. This in Christ concept becomes the key to understanding everything Paul tells his readers in the following uh, chapters, seven and eight, that the believer's life derives from being in Christ. His or her joy must be found in Christ, that our success depends upon resting in Christ and we have fellowship with others who are in Christ. As we will see, our being in Christ provides the opportunity to escape the downward drag of sin and to enjoy freedom like we've never thought possible. However, it's no guarantee that we will experience that kind of a joy uh, in this lifetime, like emancipation, we must know, that is, understand the truth. We must reckon, that is, to claim the truth. And we must yield, that is, to apply its truth. Unfortunately, our old master refuses to release its grip. <laughs> Sin, amen, ain't going away gently and quietly into the night. Whose slave are you? Help us, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name we pray. Stay in Christ. Hallelujah. All right. Well, look at here, look at here. <clears throat> Next week on the 14th, we're going to begin chapter 7. Talk about the struggle. Um, the struggle of a, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, the portrait of a struggling Christian. And uh, we'll talk about the theories, the different takes on the text, uh, what folks have are saying, uh, who, who, who is Paul talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully I'll have some diagrams that really kind of break down some of the, the some of the language so that we'll understand that. So go ahead and read chapter seven, go ahead over to verse uh, chapter eight as well. Uh, and then uh, focus uh, on uh, verses one through 13 out of chapter seven. And uh, we'll go from from there. Okay. Uh, Jacqueline, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and stop uh, at this point uh, sharing. And 